3. Intersectional Inequalities I. Global Inequalities Eastern and Western European Inequalities The differences in the historical development and political economy of the various countries of the EU must be considered when comparing them. The foundation of the current economic system can be traced back to the 16th century and the rapid rise of European colonialism. In the last decades, globalization has accelerated and resulted in the transnationalization of capitalism. The national economies are interconnected and interdependent, with the global economic order being extremely hierarchical, it is historically built on a system of unequal exchange and an unequal division of labor. Raw materials, cheap labor force, and low-value-added work procedures are in the peripheries. In contrast, high-value-added work procedures are concentrated in the metropolitan centers of the global economic system. Countries that find themselves in the middle of these extremes are termed semi-periphery. In the global north, wages are higher, and the formalized labor market guarantees higher living standards as well as stricter environmental protection and work safety regulations. At the same time, periphery countries tend to have more labor-intensive industries with weaker regulations. Unsurprisingly, the direction of migration is usually from the periphery to the so-called core or center. Driven by the capitalist motivation of maximizing profit and minimizing expenses, production is outsourced to the peripheries, the textile industry is a good example, where states and thus regulations are weaker and labor and production costs, generally, can be reduced. The exploitation of cheap labor in these countries cements the hierarchical structure of the global economic system. Within this global economic system, core countries of the European Union, Western Europe, are clearly at the center. In contrast, countries of the former Eastern Bloc belong to the semi-periphery. Central Eastern European countries are not simply at a disadvantage because of their historical experiences of communist dictatorship and state socialism, which again can be examined through the lens of post-coloniality, imperialism, and colonialism of the Soviet project, but even more importantly, in the aftermath of the regime change in 89-90, they were reintegrated into inferior positions within the global economic world system. As strict controls over foreign travel and access to information were eliminated, new dimensions of opportunities and new forms of exploitation arose. With the economic shock of the transition, rising unemployment rates, growing social inequalities, and the feminization of poverty, Eastern European women, specifically poor and Roma women, became particularly vulnerable to the new forms of exploitation, for instance in the sex industry and care work. With the growing care crisis, there is an increasing demand for services such as domestic work, childcare, and, with aging Western societies, elderly care. This need is filled at least partly by migrant Eastern European women, whose work ironically frees women in recipient countries from domestic responsibilities. This is termed distorted emancipation by Eud. Although, with better wages, work conditions, and personal safety, these jobs are usually framed as opportunities for a better life for the individuals, East European female workers are often ill-treated in the recipient countries, with experiences of abuse and exploitation, especially at the hands of private employers. 40. The structure of the sex industry and the direction of human trafficking are also determined by the global economic system. As a result of the decriminalization of prostitution in Western European countries and the EU enlargement in 2004, over the last decades Eastern European women entered the sex labor market in huge numbers. Most sex workers in these countries are not local women but women originally from semi-peripheral or peripheral countries. In the case of Hungarian women, they are typically from the country's poorest regions, and Roma women are heavily overrepresented among them. Despite the decriminalization and the liberal policies of the recipient countries, most sex workers operate without legal permits. They are often isolated, do not speak the local language or understand the regulations, and can only communicate with their pimps. The purported advantages of decriminalization thus do not benefit the sex workers from the semi-peripheries, who are extremely vulnerable to exploitation and violence. The porn industry is another labor market for female migrant workers from Eastern Europe. Hungary is considered the porn capital of Europe thanks to its liberal economic policies. It has the most liberal sexual politics in the region, reasonable but relatively developed infrastructure, and, most importantly, a vast and desperate supply of cheap female workforce that the international porn industry could easily exploit. Sanyi et al., 2022, page 4.
Moreover, pornification appeared as a form of westernization, a signifier of social, economic, and ideological development. Despite digitalization and the rise of the new platform-based model of the global porn industry, the commodification and exploitation of women mostly living in the semi-periphery and periphery, including Eastern Europe, has not abetted. In the sex cam industry, for instance, female performers are vulnerable to the algorithms that contribute to online and technology-facilitated exploitation. Let us now turn to intersectional feminism to understand further how in addition to global inequalities, it is imperative to focus on the co-constitution of multiple categories such as race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, able-bodiedness, and religion in order to understand the challenges of transnational feminist scholarship and activism. B. Gender inequalities and intersectional feminism. Gender inequality refers to disparate treatment and unequal opportunities based on gender. It is a pervasive social issue endured in many societies worldwide, with specific local and historical characteristics. It affects diverse aspects of life, including education, health, economics, employment, political participation, violence, and discrimination. Addressing gender inequality and injustice requires a multifaceted framework to understand its manifold impact. An intersectional approach to gender inequality focuses on gender-based discrimination, power relations, and oppression, seeking to rectify them. Intersectional feminism is a framework that recognizes and addresses the interconnected nature of different forms of oppression and discrimination, particularly those related to gender, race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, religion, nationality, disability, and other social identities. It acknowledges that individuals can experience multiple, intersecting systems of oppression simultaneously and that these overlapping identities and experiences shape their lived realities. There is no standard definition of intersectionality. However, most scholars would associate one or more of the following principles with intersectionality. 1. Racism, sexism, class exploitation and similar systems of oppression are interconnected and mutually construct. One another, configurations of social inequalities emerge at the junction of intersecting oppressions, perceptions of social problems reflect how social actors are situated within the power relations of particular historical and social contexts, and because individuals and groups are differently located within intersecting oppressions, they have distinctive standpoints on social phenomena, Hill Collins, 2016, pages 25-30. Intersectional feminism also contributes to understanding how intersecting axes of discrimination and power systems shape women's and LGBTQI plus individuals' experiences within democratic processes and access to justice. Pursuing gender justice challenges and transforms societal norms, structures, and systems as they perpetrate and perpetuate different forms of inequality, discrimination, and violence. Ultimately, gender justice aims to create a more equitable and inclusive society for all. The intersectional approach is important for feminist democratic theory as it helps understand how different forms of discrimination co-constitute each other, producing vulnerability and inequality within democratic practices and processes. The focus lies on how injustice emerges in interconnected socio-political institutions like the heteronormative family, the community, the market, and the state, Bowen and Castro Varela, 2016, page 12. In what follows, we will engage with the important contribution made by different approaches to intersectionality theory and outline how these have enriched struggles for equality and justice, especially concerning marginalized subjectivities and communities, including racial and religious minorities, colonial subjects, LGBTQI plus people, people with disability, racialized people, and women. We also focus on interventions from the Global South, some of which are disregarded within Western debates on intersectionality politics. These are black feminism, post-colonial feminism, feminist disability studies, and Roma feminism. Finally, we argue that despite the shortcomings, intersectional politics significantly contributes to the analysis of and struggles against inequality. Intersectional politics and intersectional corrective methodology make important contributions to engendering democracy in spaces of democratic participation. 1. Black Feminism the term intersectionality was coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who highlighted the limitations of traditional feminist and anti-racist theories in addressing the unique experiences of black women. Crenshaw argues that traditional feminist movements often focus solely on the experiences of white, middle-class women and fail to address the unique challenges faced by women from marginalized communities. 
For example, a black woman may face sexism and racism, and these forms of oppression can overlap, interact, and compound, resulting in unique challenges and experiences that differ from those faced by white women or black men. Because women of color experience racism in ways not always the same as those experienced by men of color and sexism in ways not always parallel to experiences of white women, anti-racism and feminism are limited, even on their own terms. Intersectional feminism builds upon this insight by highlighting that women's experiences and struggles are not uniform and that gender intersects with other social categories to create distinct forms of disadvantage and privilege, Bowen and Castro Varela, 2016, page 14. This resulted in an epistemological framework and theoretical categories that attempted to reflect the experiences of different subject positions. The oft-quoted statement by the Combahee River Collective astutely summarizes the efforts, a combined anti-racist and anti-sexist position drew us together initially, and as we developed politically, we addressed ourselves to heterosexism and economic oppression under capitalism, Combahee River Collective, 1984, page 4. The assumption that global patriarchy equally victimized all women was central to intersectional feminist critique. Such a viewpoint, which sums up the focus of the second-wave feminist movement, not only implies that all other power relations, such as racism and classism derive from patriarchy and correspondingly disappear with the victory over the same but also suggests that sexism is a universal and transhistorical phenomenon. The U.S. feminists of color provided theoretical alternatives in challenging the exclusive focus on universal patriarchy that neglected other forms of discrimination. It is important to note that the alternative was not to simply add and stir other grounds of discrimination to sexism. Rather, the interrelations of diverse forms of discrimination and the co-constitution of social categories were considered, Doan and Castro Varela, 2016, page 14. By adopting an intersectional approach, feminists challenged the foundational premises of single-issue politics as proposed by black feminist scholarship. It addresses the co-constitutiveness of sexism, racism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and other forms of discrimination, which intersect to create overlapping systems of privilege and oppression, Doan and Castro Varela, 2016, pages 14-15. The pursuit of an inclusive and diverse feminist movement considers the experiences and needs of individuals and groups with varying identities and backgrounds. It does not erase and hierarchize different forms of oppression or essentialize gender. The intersectional approach combines feminist theory with anti-discrimination politics by focusing on the varied experiences of diverse constituencies without losing sight of the simultaneity, contradictions, and interdependencies of these perspectives, Doan and Castro Varela, 2016, pages 14 to 15. Intersectional feminism emphasizes the importance of solidarity and alliance politics while recognizing that different groups of women may face different struggles and require different strategies for achieving equality and justice. It seeks to create inclusive spaces for dialogue, learning, and coalition building across various social movements. In practical terms, intersectional feminism addresses gender-based violence, reproductive rights, economic inequality, racial discrimination, LGBTQI plus rights, disability rights, and more. Intersectional feminists work towards creating inclusive spaces, amplifying marginalized voices, challenging stereotypes, and promoting social, political, and economic justice for everyone, regardless of their intersecting identities. Patricia Hill Collins' work builds upon and expands the intersectional framework developed by Crenshaw. Power relations are viewed through the matrix of domination concept, which examines how intersecting oppressions create distinct social positions for individuals and how power structures are maintained through multiple interconnected systems. It outlines how political domination on the macro level of analysis is organized via intersecting systems of oppression, a power analytic that both explains oppression and suggests strategies for resisting it, Hill Collins, 2017, page 22. Hill Collins explains that power has multiple sources and is understood to operate dynamically within social and political arenas. Different forms of domination have distinct power grids and intersecting power. Dynamics. This helps us understand how social inequalities that flow from intersecting oppressions are ordered across power domains. Intersections of racism, capitalism, and sexism within, for instance, the USA will differ from those in Brazil or India, producing a distinctive matrix of domination inter- and internationally. Therefore, the USA, 
Brazil, and India can neither be reduced to one another, nor some general principles of domination disregarding the specificity of their histories. For example, there is no causal relationship between how immigration policies articulate citizenship in different geopolitical and historical contexts. In addition to understanding the exercise of power, resistance is an important focus for intersectional feminism. The concept of community as a site of solidarity and empowerment plays an important role in Hill Collins's understanding of the matrix of domination. This framework helps capture the complexities and instabilities that characterize how domination and resistance coexist. Resistance is embedded within domination, and communities constitute a necessary, albeit ambiguous, bedrock of politics. This goes against liberal democratic theories that promise individual citizens personal freedom if they succeed in breaking free from the structures of various collectivities. Hill Collins foregrounds collective politics over the valorization of the individual as the primary subject of citizenship, 2017, page 28. Marginalized individuals and communities, in her view, can develop alternative knowledges and collective strategies that challenge and disrupt systems of domination. Recognizing their shared experiences and building coalitions across different social groups allows marginalized individuals to engage in transformative activism and work towards social justice. For instance, black women's political activism was articulated by working for institutional transformation and group survival within a larger framework of collective struggles for social justice. This shows how care work is deeply embedded within African American communities' survival politics and serves a broader political purpose. Lastly, Hill Collins draws on the relationship between intersectionality and participatory democracy. For her, they share a common set of concerns, both aspire to imagine new social relations of equality, fairness, inclusion, and social justice. Achieving these ethical ends for both projects requires building equitable communities of inquiry and praxis that can survive within yet challenge intersecting oppressions, Hill Collins, 2017, page 35. The challenge consists in building intellectual and political solidarities across differences in power, i.e., to address diverse social differences without undermining the necessary solidarity across categories or inadvertently reinforcing essentialisms and reifications, such that former margins can be transformed into oppositional centers, Doan and Castro Varela, 2016, pages 14 to 15. Intersectional participatory democracy is, for Collins, a project primarily undertaken by marginalized communities in the form of inquiry and praxis. The goal is to empower groups and not merely contribute to the inclusion of individuals. She opposes formal inclusion from the top since token inclusion in social institutions is not the same as gaining political power. Participatory democracy, from the perspective of elected officials, differs from that of subordinated groups. Both may embrace principles of participatory democracy, especially if such principles are hegemonic. Nevertheless, belief in the same value systems cannot override highly unequal possibilities for participation across multiple power domains. In contrast to top-down managerial ethos, bottom-up understandings of participatory democracy deepen through use. Hill Collins, 2017, page 37. This is the case for many black women who confront ubiquitous social problems by drawing on and formulating solutions based on shared collective experiences. The strategies are then tested and revised via social action. In addition to the focus on the co-constitutiveness of the different categories, it is imperative to also engage with the conflicts and tensions between the categories so that anti-discrimination policies do not end up reinforcing essentialist identity politics, which would lead to counterproductive effects, Doan and Castro Varela, 2016, pages 14 to 15. The dilemma, already highlighted by Audre Lorde's powerful remark, there is no hierarchy of oppressions, is how to negotiate between different forms of discrimination without giving precedence to one over the other. Lorde shares her experience as a black lesbian woman who did not have the luxury of only fighting one form of oppression, rather, it was imperative to struggle against sexism, heterosexism, racism, anti-Semitism, and capitalism on multiple fronts without prioritizing one over the other. Lord outlines how oppressed groups are pitted against each other and how this division serves the interests of hegemonic groups, who profit from disrupting joint political action. Instead of cooperation, there is competition between diverse groups, which undermines a common fight against multiple axes of inequality, Doan and Castro Varela, 2023, pages 9 to 10. 
By outlining the affinities between experiences, intersectionality does not flatten the uniqueness of particular sufferings but pursues the hope of building alliances across differences. 2. Postcolonial Feminism Intersectionality as a traveling concept has had unparalleled contributions to feminist scholarship and activism. Nevertheless, its relevance for the post-colonial world remains a contentious issue. There have been controversial disputes regarding the export of theory from the global north to the global south and the extraction of data from the global south by feminists from the global north. The asymmetry and non-reciprocity between these two ends indicate the challenges of transnational feminist alliance building, Dowen and Castro Varela, 2016, page 19. Another challenge is contextualizing the race-class-gender triad according to the specificity of different post-colonial societies. For example, the focus on caste within the Indian context is more relevant than race, and this is also pertinent for understanding the relations of power within the Indian diaspora. Similarly, categories such as First Nations, Native Americans, or Pueblos Originarios cannot be simply subsumed under the umbrella term race and even less under that of migration. Neglecting these nuances distorts any examination of historical processes of discrimination. Similarly, an overemphasis on race can lead to class being disregarded. Dowen and Castro Varela, 2016, pages 23 to 24. As the polemical debate between Nancy Fraser and Judith Butler has taught us, the conflict between categories of class, race, and gender endures. Not only do these axes of discrimination overlap and co-constitute each other, but they also clash and sideline each other. Inevitably one is overemphasized over the other, Dowen and Castro Varela, 2023, page 6. Therefore, it is imperative not to lose sight of the singularities of each category while highlighting structural entanglements. Postcolonial scholars also warn against equating anti-racist politics with decolonization. Even though race is a prominent category of critique, one should not understand decolonization simply in terms of dismantling racist structures and narratives. As Mahmoud Mamdani, 1996, page 288, rightly observes, the historical legitimacy of nationalist governments after decolonization was principally measured in terms of whether they initiated. 45. An effective deracialization. Mamdani reminds us that this resulted in deracialization without democratization, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, IBID. Framed as an indigenization program or nationalization, one of the primary aims was to dismantle the privileges that white colonizers had accumulated through racist and imperialist politics. This led to the neglect of other urgent sites of oppression in post-colonial societies, such as class, gender, sexuality, and religion, Dowen and Castro Varela, 2016, pages 24 to 25. Unless these critical interventions are given due consideration, intersectionality can end up being old wine in a new bottle. The Indian feminist Nevada Menon, 2015, page 4, avers that intersectionality merely becomes a buzzword for a long-known fact. Menon warns against equating India with the USA while drawing attention to the contestation of the single-axis framework by marginalized groups in the Indian context long before intersectionality was exported to the global south. In her view, feminist politics in a context like India is unthinkable without interventions of Dalit women. She discusses how Dalit activists, for instance, reject feminist categories such as sex work as this trivializes the historical relations of sexual exploitation imposed by the hegemonic upper castes on vulnerable Dalit women. In a context where Dalit's women were forced into prostitution in the name of tradition, Dalit scholars reject the term sex work, which suggests wage labor and free choice. Menon uses this example to illustrate the interplay between gender, sexuality, class, and caste, drawing attention to the important criticism of Dalit and Adivasi scholars against upper caste and upper class feminist scholarship and politics. Elite Indian feminists long neglected the caste category and disregarded the survival struggles of disenfranchised groups, Dowen and Castro Varela, 2023, page 3. Disagreeing with Menon, Mary John argues that the strength of an intersectional approach lies in its ability to make transparent the problem of multiple and overlapping discriminations by pointing to a place where identities fail to appear or be recognized as we might have expected them, Ibid. Here John supports the claim that intersectionality functions as a corrective methodology. John agrees with Menon on the problem of universalism and the assumption that any theory developed in the West can be applied everywhere. 
Regrettably, non-Western concepts and theories are not guaranteed the same reception. John, however, suggests that simply rejecting all universalisms is not a viable solution, Ibid, page 75. This debate is instructive in that it warns of the dangers of a simple transplantation from the West into the post-colonial context, which is questionable and intellectually dubious, Bowen and Castro Varela, 2016, pages 20-21. Nevertheless, as John remarks, above all else, then, there is a profound need for more critical dialogue across global feminist margins and centers. I, for one, think that intersectionality would make for an excellent candidate in such an endeavor, Menon, 2015, p. 3. Feminist Disability Studies Disability studies are considered a well-established yet constantly evolving discipline despite their relatively short history. They emerged from American and British disabled people's movements in the 1970s. Subsequently, disabled and non-disabled scholars developed them in social sciences and the humanities in the following decades. Disability studies have undergone several epistemological, theoretical, and methodological transformations that are considered evidence of the growing maturity and openness of debate within Rollstone. Et al., 2012, page 4. Simultaneously, Disability studies are intended to remain the academic counterpart of the disabled people's movement, Longmore, 2003, page 2. Hence, the fundamental goal of disability studies is to enhance the lived experiences of people with disability. To meet this commitment, disability studies scholars, many of whom are activists as well, have continued to challenge the medicalized model of disability, Mitchell and Snyder, 1997, page 24, and unreflective paradigms of normality, Mikosha, 2004, page 724, that traditionally underpinned academic research about disabled people slash people with disability. Moreover, focusing on disabled people's perspectives and expertise is central to this discipline and its methodology. Therefore, disability studies research is intended to serve, firstly and foremostly, disabled people, who are understood as subjects and not objects of academic scrutiny. The social model of disability was initially conceived by British academic Mike Oliver and the British disability activists in opposition to the dominant discourses on disabled people that permeated capitalist welfare states. The focus on the materiality of disability and the structural basis to disability discrimination, Mikosha, 2004, page 729, constituted a revolutionary paradigm shift regarding individual, medical, philanthropic, and personal tragedy approaches to disability. The social model influenced disability studies worldwide, shaping the human rights discourse on disability as encapsulated by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, UNCRPD, and backed by disabled activists worldwide. The social model of disability has roots in the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, UPS, created in 1972 in Great Britain, a groundbreaking reconceptualization of disability. The organization's fundamental premise was that it would be led and controlled by people with physical impairments and not, as was usually the case with disability organizations, by non-disabled people. Their revolutionary political ideology of disability, Shakespeare, 2006, page 11, was outlined in the fundamental principles of disability. UPS leaders argue that disability is a situation which is caused by social conditions and thus requires its elimination, UPS, 1976, page 3. In so doing, they categorically undermined the causal link between impairment and disability, which hegemonic models of disability such as the individual, medical, charity, and personal tragedy rested on. Instead, they established clear-cut boundaries between those two notions. Impairment was defined as lacking all or part of a limb or having a defective limb, organism, or mechanism of the body. At the same time, disability was understood as the disadvantage or restriction of activity caused by a contemporary social organization, UPS, 1976, pages 3 to 4. Hence, they declared that disability is wholly and exclusively social, Oliver, 1996, page 41. The passage expressing this radical shift's essence reads, In our view, it is a society which disables physically impaired people. Disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. Disabled people are, therefore, an oppressed group in society, UPS, 1976, page 3. 
The last sentence of the above cited statement captures another major contribution that UPS activists have to theorization and, in turn, to the politicization of disability. Drawing parallels with different historically segregated oppressed groups, they argued that people with impairments, by virtue of being disabled by societal forces, also constituted an oppressed group. Hence, UPS was not only run by disabled people but was also guided by a political principle of redirecting the focus from people with impairments onto the broader systems of oppression and segregation that made them disabled. Hence, through disability activism that was mediated by organizations they themselves led, they attempted to re-gain control over their own lives in society and impact the lives of other disabled people. UPS leaders' reconceptualization of disability, as Carol Thomas aptly points out, took place in the light of the social exclusions encountered in their own lived experience, 2014, page 10, and was informed by their worldviews and ideological standpoints. The critical influence over the intellectual and political agenda of UPS is attributed to Paul Hunt and Vic Finkelstein, both of whom were physically impaired and had, to different degrees, experienced the mechanism of societal segregation, Finkelstein as a civil rights activist opposing the South African apartheid and Hunt as a resident of a care home. Having Marxist leanings, their analysis of the powerlessness of disabled people in the much bigger institution, that of society highlighted material dimensions of oppression which were bound up with the social relations of production in capitalist society, Thomas, 2007, page 53. This could manifest in the form of different types of disabling barriers such as flights of steps, inadequate public and personal transport, unsuitable housing, rigid work routines in factories and offices, and a lack of up-to-date aids and equipment, UPS, Ames Paragraph 1. This materialist standpoint was also enhanced by UPS' politically potent organizational style that, as Shakespeare describes, was coherent and disciplined due to being modeled on labor movement politics, 2006, page 14. On the other hand, the Liberation Network, which was modeled on feminism and personal growth as well as co-led by disabled women, proved to be less strategically effective in the socio-economic environment of Great Britain, Shakespeare, 2006, p. It is based on this intellectual and activist lineage that in 1983 Michael Oliver, the first professor of disability studies, coined the term social model of disability that became the central notion for both British disability studies and the British disabled people's movement. Oliver conceptualized the social model of disability as a binary opposite to the individual and medical models of disability. However, he was not introducing a new idea per se. As he stressed, he took this division quite simply and explicitly from the distinction originally made between impairment and disability by the union of the physically impaired against segregation, Oliver, 1990, page 98. Building on feminist epistemologies, it can be argued that the specific situatedness and certain privileges of UPS leaders that stemmed from them being white Western men with physical impairments curtailed the extent to which UPS could have been representative of a diverse community of disabled people, Birds et al., 2019, page 7. Therefore, UPS has been associated with achievements and shortcomings resulting from partial knowledge making and is subject to justified critique. The most immediate flaw that was identified pertained to the definition of disability, which included only physically impaired people, UPS, 1976, page 3, leaving people with other types of impairments out in the cold. Moreover, as disabled and mostly female activists and scholars pointed out, UPS disability politics was a mix of radical elements with conservative ones. Feminist activists with disabilities argued that the liberatory potential of disability left-wing political organizations, Thomas, 1999, page 74, like UPIAS, was limited due to being male-dominated and male-oriented. Morris, 1991, page 9. And, as such, dominated by a view of the world that was unashamedly male, Morris, 1990, page 160. Specifically, this situation led to sustaining the private-slash-public dualism in which problems and lived experiences were deemed domestic and were not treated as real political issues because they were about private life. Hence, such issues were considered to be of little significance for disabled people as a societal group. As Tom Shakespeare puts it, ale, instrumental, public, rational, and material concerns were seen as more pressing than domestic issues, 2000, page 160. 
Hence not only the personal experience of disability in general, Morris, 1991, page 9, but also gendered dimensions of disability and disablism such as the particular oppression that women with disabilities experience, Lonsdale, 1990, page 175, were overlooked by Eupias and because of that were not well captured in their theorization of disability and disablement. Furthermore, British materialist feminist disability scholarship akin to the British materialist disability studies has been shaped by respective academics' worldviews, ideological standpoints, and personal experiences. Specifically, British materialist feminist disability scholars treat the social model of disability and feminist perspectives as their critical conceptual and analytical tools. Importantly, their interpretation and application of both the social model and feminism have been informed by their and other disabled women's lives and activists' experiences. They considered the appearance of the social model of disability to be a turning point in their personal lives as it helped to change how they perceived their disability. They also argued that it was a revolutionary concept more broadly due to its main premises, which they firmly adhered to in conceptualizing disability as a social and political issue. In interpreting disability as a form of oppression, they stressed the detrimental effects of socio-structural barriers on par with social attitudes, treating the social model as a tool for empowerment and activism. Liz Crow has captured those sentiments well in her often quoted statement. My life has two phases, before the social model of disability, and after it. Discovering this way of thinking about my experiences was the proverbial raft in stormy seas. It gave me an understanding of my life, shared with thousands, even millions, of other people around the world, and I clung to it. This was the explanation I had sought for years. Suddenly what I had always known, deep down, was confirmed. It wasn't my body that was responsible for all my difficulties, it was external factors, the barriers constructed by the society in which I live. I was being disabled, my capabilities and opportunities were being restricted, by prejudice, discrimination, inaccessible environments and inadequate support. Even more important, if all the problems had been created by society, then surely society could uncreate them. Revolutionary! For years now this social model of disability has enabled me to confront, survive and even surmount countless situations of exclusion and discrimination. It has been my mainstay, as it has been for the wider disabled people's movement. It has enabled a vision of ourselves free from the constraints of disability, oppression, and provided a direction for our commitment to social change. It has played a central role in promoting disabled people's individual self-worth, collective identity and political organization. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that the social model has saved lives. Gradually, very gradually, its sphere is extending beyond our movement to influence policy and practice in the mainstream. The contribution of the social model of disability, now and in the future, to achieving equal rights for disabled people is incalculable, Crow, 1996, pages 206 to 207. Simultaneously, upon closer examination of the areas and issues that the male social model associated with the premises mentioned above, disabled feminists evidence that the social model of disability was biased towards the lived experiences and needs of disabled men. It was a privileged, a male-oriented vision of society that includes male-dominated sociological accounts of disability, Oliver, 1999, page 27. Feminism turned out to be an ideal tool for British disabled female scholars because it enabled redressing flaws of the social model and, due to certain overlaps with it, allowed them to keep the social model's framework. It could be argued that thanks to feminism, those academics' adherence to the social model was not weakened but strengthened, albeit in its renewed and improved form. However, stating that those disabled feminists were feminists is not enough. This is because, as Barbara Fawcett explains, feminism has become fragmented. It has become an umbrella term with numerous different explanations being proposed as to the source of and solutions to women's oppression there is no one feminist means of analysis. The greatest proponent among this group of feminist social modelists are the materialist feminists, Thomas, 1999, page 2, whose theoretical perspective enables disablism in terms of the productive forces, the social relations of production and reproduction, and in the cultural formations and ideologies in society, Thomas, 1999, page 143. This perspective overlaps with the core premise of the strong social model, which affirms that disability understood as a form of oppression is socially produced due to the workings of late capitalism and often takes the form of various barriers. 
However, it enriches this premise by including the gendered nature of Thomas, 1999, page 143, which is meant to benefit not only disabled women but disabled people and democracies in general. The identity-first and person-first languages emerged due to the changing and varied understandings of disability. The first notion has often been associated with the proponents of the social model of disability as conceptualized by the British Disabled People's Movement and Studies. In contrast, the second concept has been linked with the North American tradition of the socio-political disability model slash minority model. Moreover, person-first language has recently been propagated internationally through the UNCRPD, legitimizing its connection with the human right disability paradigm. However, the meanings of those approaches are not set in stone and can vary between and across disability communities. Therefore, depending on the accepted epistemological perspective and socio-political standpoint which influence the interpretation of those terms, either the former or latter notion is considered by disability activists and disability studies scholars as reflective of the emancipatory politics of the disabled people's movement that can challenge oppressive hegemonic discourses. There is no consensus within the disabled people's movement as to which of those notions is a more potent tool for politicizing disability and which, on the contrary, depoliticizes it. Nevertheless, it can be argued that the ongoing debates about this issue are a source of much-needed fuel for action and critical analysis. As Katerina Heyer explains, in either case, disability terminology, what do we call ourselves? What do we ask others to call us becomes an important political tool to reclaim a sense of identity and personhood, 2007, page 277. 4. Roma Feminism Roma are the largest minority in Europe and thus present a unique insight into the challenges of the relevance of intersectionality in the EU. Roma are geographically concentrated in Central and Eastern Europe, C, and the majority live in post-communist societies, many of which currently face the political challenges of populism and illiberalism. The Roma issue has been on the political agenda of the EU well before the accession of the CE countries. Engaging with social exclusion, discrimination, and the non-recognition of Roma is obligatory for EU membership. Member states must adopt non-discrimination legislation and implement social integration policies through the EU funds. However, it is important to note that the focus on the Roma communities did not automatically result in recognizing the problems facing Romani women. Their experiences did not become a political or policy issue, such that the intersection of anti-Roma discrimination and gender issues was not a major concern for the EU and the member states. It took the efforts of non-government organizations, international organizations, and Roma feminists to gain recognition and to politically advance the issue of multiple disadvantages of Romani women. To understand the emergence and development of the Romani women's movement after the fall of the state socialist system, we should look at both bottom-up and top-down social and political processes. Romani women engaged in political activism and first articulated their concerns within Romani political movements. The aim was to be recognized as a stateless nation in Europe and the member states as a means to the political emancipation of the Roma. Romani women, however, often faced sexism and misogyny within the movement. Like Romani men, they faced discrimination from the non-Romani, but they also experienced sexism within their community. They thus sought alliances with non-Romani feminists, which was not always possible as they faced racism in these feminist organizations. Thus, in these initial years, Romani women activists could either position themselves along the ethnic or the gender issue without being able to formulate and express their intersecting experiences. Besides the support from non-Romani feminist groups, the recognition of Romani women's problems by international organizations and EU institutions also helped create the institutional background for Romani women. The Open Society Foundation initially helped to establish the Joint Romani Women's Initiative in the mid-90s JRWI. Some years later, the Council of Europe and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe initiated the International Romani Women's Network IRWN. These two forums represented different approaches and values concerning the Romani women's issue. The JRWI was radical, while the IRWN was more conservative. The JRWI dealt with sensitive issues such as sexual harassment, early marriages, trafficking, prostitution, and intimate and other forms of gender-based violence. At the same time, the IRWN refused to address these concerns. The only exception was the forced sterilization of Romani women, which was an important topic for the IRWN. 
The divergences in values were partly due to generational differences, as engaging with these sensitive issues entailed challenging existing male-dominated structures of the Romani movement. At the same time, the focus on these problems created new difficulties for Romani women because this reinforced the stereotypical image of the aggressive Roma men. The recognition of Romani women's multiple disadvantages was gradually included within the EU policy frameworks, and intersectionality as a policy approach was introduced. In 2008 and 2011, the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU surveyed the Roma populations in Europe, additionally focusing on gender-related issues as well. The results lead to policy focus on the intersectional inequalities and gaps between Romani men and women. While there has been a move towards a more intersectional approach on the international and European policy level, the current social and political processes have not significantly assuaged the problems of Romani women. Twenty years after the fall of communism, some of the CE countries, such as Hungary and Poland, experienced a backlash against liberal democracy and turned to a liberalism and or populism. These regimes are characterized by a strong anti-gender and anti-minority political agenda, creating new challenges for Romani women. Gender equality has been steadily replaced by anti-women and anti-Roma family policies. This promotes and supports the idea of the family over women's rights and consolidates the myth of the respectable and worthy family that is white, non-Roma, economically self-sufficient, and does not rely on social welfare. Through its various social support schemes, the non-Roma middle and higher middle-class families have been the greatest beneficiaries of the state family policies in Hungary. The difficulties of Roma families and women are not on the political agenda. This discrimination and exclusion along with their experience of multiple vulnerabilities can be better understood in the context of violence against Romani women. A specific subfield in scholarship on domestic and sexual violence and prostitution slash sex work, violence against Romani women, remains a controversial issue. It is self-evident that women from disadvantaged and socially excluded minority populations are at higher risk of experiencing violence. However, public and political narratives on the Roma are strongly divided along ideological and political lines, such that conservative and nationalist or far-right discourses blame Roma for their disadvantaged social position. They often deploy essentialist, paternalist, and criminalizing discourses while ethnicizing social problems. Especially in the case of discussions on domestic violence and prostitution slash sex work, Romani women are often stereotyped and victimized. Liberal or leftist discourses take a social constructivist approach and treat social and ethnic factors separately. Instead of blaming the victim, the effort is to contest stereotyping minority groups to offer a more nuanced reading of complex power relations in society. However, this brings with it the dilemma of whether or not to highlight the ethnic background of Romani men as perpetrators and Romani women as vulnerable victims, which can result in patronizing them by invisibilizing the specific forms of inequality they face. In resisting the typecasting of Romani men as violence-prone and Romani women as victims to be rescued from their traditional culture, there is also the danger of falling into the trap of cultural relativism. On the one hand, it is argued that being open about ethnicity in cases of violence against Romani women is imperative to not fall prey to political correctness. On the other hand, it is asserted that this feeds into hate speech discourses about minorities. Drawing on intersectionality, it is maintained that ethnicity implies a vulnerability factor in gender-based violence. The multiple intersecting systems of inequality, such as gender, class, and ethnicity, engender poverty, social exclusion, and discrimination, which results in a higher risk of victimization. This also limits access to social services, public education, and employment. Romani women face acute disadvantages due to patriarchal relations within the community and discrimination in the larger society. Violence against Roma women is culturalized, and this further hinders Romani women from receiving the necessary support from institutions. In light of these considerations, several civil society organizations and advocacy groups emphasize divulging the victim's ethnicity as essential in assisting them in designing targeted policies. It is argued that he failure to collect data disaggregated by ethnicity in the anti-trafficking field constitutes a major barrier to tracing this human rights violation and consequently to developing appropriate policies on prevention and victims' assistance, European Roma Rights Center, 2011, page 32.
Organizations such as the European Roma Rights Center or the Human Rights Watch do collect disaggregated data and publish them, as well as focus on ethnicity in reaching out to victims of violence. Romani victims face far more challenges than non-racialized women when seeking help. For example, the stress in the police is stronger as a consequence of experiences of maltreatment by the authorities, and internalized patriarchal norms hinder Romani women from going outside the community for support. In contrast to this approach, ardent critics of wokeness claim that problems related to poverty and disadvantages affecting the Roma should be discussed openly. They argue that it is well known that violence is more prevalent in segregated ghettos, that Romani women hesitate from help-seeking and are exploited within their community. These positions decry the romanticization ten and relativization of the problems by practitioners of political correctness. Political strategies of omitting ethnicity result in more stereotyping than less. Disregarding focus on ethnicity, it is claimed, causes more harm and obstructs advocacy and policy. It is contended that colorblind human rights discourses are problematic as they obscure the reality of experiences of Romani women in the name of protecting them. For example, not mentioning where the victims come from, ghettos, and what happens to them, being exploited and violated by the male members of their community, is counterproductive in helping victims. It is important to consider the difference between the intersectional approach and political correctness. While both focus on the importance of ethnicity, the former emphasizes internal and external exploitations and discrimination. In contrast, the latter focuses less on the external constraints and factors contributing to Roma women's victimization. Even as gender-based violence is not exclusive to any one culture, socioeconomic group, or country, withholding ethnicity in the case of gender-based violence can, on the one hand, prevent stereotypical representations of the Roma community, but simultaneously, can also perpetuate cultural relativism. Drawing on intersectional, postcolonial, and queer feminist insights, it is advisable to explore ways of considering the role of ethnicity without ethnicizing the problem of gender-based violence. Intersectional, postcolonial, and queer feminist approaches warn against the deployment of gender-based violence to reinforce racist and patriarchal structures in transnational contexts. Discussions of gender-based violence, as in the case of Romani women, within minority communities, risk being strategically co-opted to perpetuate racism in the name of protection from gender-based violence. Ironically, the proliferation of discourses on violence may also simultaneously make the contestation of gender-based violence impossible. Alliances between different communities and movements against gender-based violence could offer a platform for future transnational feminist projects that contest gender injustice.